show, and the subject is the category of tonkas. So starting out, we're going to look at some Tibetan paint pots. And the Tibetans, of course, mix their paints in little wooden bowls. And um, you can see it, one of the center is actually a little wooden bowl out of pigments and glue. And there's some brushes over on the left in a kind of a long sheath. And mineral pigments, and they usually cover them with water at night so they don't dry out. And this is the way it would look. Hmm? At night, they'd cover the paint with water so they wouldn't dry out. So this actually, this painting uh, mm -hmm. picture is from a, a book, but it shows a llama painting a mural. At the bottom, there's some more little paint pots. You can actually see the wood and some handmade brushes. And the procedure in painting on a wall is similar to making a tonka, where you paint in all the broad, large areas of color and then do the shading, and then do the gold, and then do the lines. You can see there's a little bit of shading already in the cloud areas. Here is Marpa. and He's not finished. He doesn't have his hair and all the expression in the face and so forth. The lines aren't in, but you can see the, the main patterns in the robes. Some of the gold work's already been done around the edge of that throne. And here's a monk working on a green Tara painting, similar to <coughs> the slide we saw of Taja's school. And he's got a wooden bar to rest his hand on. And they like to paint vertically. And there's, again, the rope tie tied onto the canvas to hold the painting up. Here are two of the miniature paintings called Tsakli. And they're probably about three by four inches, uh, very small. These have a little bit of brocade around them. Two wrathful deities, looks like Vajra Bhairava on the right. And we'll come back to anything you want to, to look at again. Okay. Um, so this first one here is hand embroidered. So this is in that category of gotong. So hand embroidered tonka. Um, I've never done the embroidery, so I don't know what that's like, but you could guess the kind of work it would be to embroider a Buddha like this. Does anybody know who this Buddha is? Who is this? Shakyamuni. How do you know it's Shakyamuni? Hmm? Yeah. Earth touching mudra, right. <coughs> Good. Okay. Did everybody get that? <laughs> okay. And this next one is a hand woven Buddha. So it's not embroidered, but actually hand woven. And this is a form of Amitabha, who's a red Buddha. And this Buddha's name is Amitayus, and the difference between him and Amitabha is that he is um, for long life purposes. So if you're doing a long life practice or wish to do a special sadhana for somebody to extend their life, then Amitayus would be one of the deities that you could use. You could also use White Tara for that same purpose. So he's a Buddha in Bodhisattva's clothing. And this is a machine-woven Buddha. Actually, it's about 8 by 10 inches. It's pretty small. And these come out of India now from Benares. And they're excellent. And they're done by computer. They have a computer design. It goes into this weaving machine. And they crank out the deities. <laughs> and they're quite good, quite wonderful. I've got one, of, one like this in the shrine room of the green tar. I'll show you. So this is an applique. The applique is cut out pieces of cloth sewn together to make a pattern, right? 
So you can see particularly in the center of the nimbus is a kind of a wonderful pattern piece for the center of the nimbus. Everything else has been cut out and sewn by hand, a little stitching around the edges of the cloth. And here is a green tara, also appliqued, little pieces of silk cut out and sewn together. another green Tara. This one I saw when I was in Kathmandu living for a couple of years and the man who used to sew my Tonka brocades was also a skilled um, applique artist. So he not only made the brocade for this but he actually um, did the, the Tonka. I wanted really badly to buy this but I didn't have the two hundred dollars. I wish I had because it's a wonderful, <laughs> it's a wonderful green tara, and very few Tibetans still can do this work. Uh, so this wonderful green tara, and then uh, this is another tonka, an appliqued tonka. In this tradition, uh, which we used to find a lot in Tibet, and no longer, of course, since 1959. But this photograph was taken in Bhutan and this tradition is still being carried out. They have some huge applique tonkas, which are, in this case, are only displayed once a year. And they're, you know, you can see about 30 people carrying out this big, long, rolled-up painting. And there it is. And it's all made of pieces of silk and so forth. And it's Guru Rinpoche or Padmasambhava, and uh, they bring it out once a year, and they have a special celebration. So it must be, you know, 50 feet, I don't know, it's huge. And they, every monastery had these special display tankas. And um, <coughs> I don't know where they all went, but um, they're quite magnificent. So here's another a little Guru Rinpoche. And this is also applique, but instead of being sewn down, the pieces are glued down. And they have actually woven the they woven the applique pieces. The vines are woven through the rainbows. Can you see how that's been done? And then all glued down. It's very beautiful. And there may be some painting added to the face. It looks like the face has been painted. So some of the details may have been added in terms of paint. And it looks like maybe some shading on the red flowers has been added in terms of paint. So this is the first tonka in the category of regular painted tonkas. And I'm showing you this one because it's rather unusual. Most tonkas have a vertical format. And this one's horizontal, and it has three main subjects. It doesn't have just one subject, but it has three subjects. So guess who's in the middle with his little pointed yellow hat? <laughs> Droma? Tsongkhapa, right. So that's the, that's the symbol of Tsongkhapa, the yellow pandita's hat, or scholar's hat, or the one who was a knowledge holder, that yellow hat with the point. Sometimes those hats are red and sometimes maybe even different colors, but when we see a yellow hat like that, we know that it's a Galupa sect, and it's probably going to be Tsongkhapa if he's got the Dharma Chakra Mudra, and there he does, right? Mm -hmm. Usually also this cloud Special kind of cloud, right, coming from Maitreya's um, Paradise, right? Yeah. So, on the right is who? Anybody? Who is that white man with the four arms? He's holding a flower in his left hand. Chenrezig, mm -hmm. right? It's Chenrezig. And is Sonkap also an emanation of 
Or Chin Rei Zhi is um, an emanation of Tsongkhapa? Yeah, I guess he would be. An of All the Dalai Lamas are. Of, um, All together, okay, great. And the Dalai Lama is said to be a, a living Chin Rei Zhi as well. The Dalai Lama, when they call him, when they call the Dalai Lama in the newspaper and they say he's a living God, what they mean is that he is an emanation of a bodhisattva, which is Chinresi. It means that the archetype of Chinresi is running through his, he's a living example of how Chinresi should be. That's, it's kind of hard to say, um, translate that. But to say he's a living God is a little strange. And why isn't he red? <laughs> It's it's actually actually it could be Shakyamuni. <coughs> well, it could be Shakyamuni, and it also can be um, Amitabha painted gold. So, in a sense, they're they are the same. In this case, um, I think it's Amitabha, but it could be either way because any Buddha who's red or blue or yellow or green could also be painted gold, and Shakyamuni is always painted gold. So um, you could say that it's Shakyamuni, or you could say that it's Amitabha in this case. Now we're going to look at an example of wall painting, and this one comes from Ladakh, which is western cultural area. It's no longer Tibet. It's actually in India. It's a high plateau, kind of like Santa Fe. It's a dry desert kind of place. So these wall paintings, being in a dry climate, have survived from the 14th century. These are, these are 600 years old. You can see that the colors and the condition of the paintings is pretty good after 600 years. Huh? And this is a tiny gompa, or or a meditation hall, and the ceilings are pretty low, and they've filled the walls with some wonderful deities. On the far left over here, if I can find it, here is Kama Chakra. He's recognizable by the fact that he's got more than one color in his arms and legs. You can see that he's got several colors, blue arms, he's got yellow arms, he's got white arms. And the next one over is uh, Chakra Samvara and Vajrayogini, the two major Kaju Yidams. The next one over is He Vajra, which is a Yidam from the He Vajra Tantra, and this was Marpa's Yidam because he translated the He Vajra Tantra. And the next one is a white Mahakala, whose attribute is like. Um, Ganesha and Jambala, he brings wealth. Okay. And then we have a regular black or dark blue Mahakala who is a Dharma protector. So in the category of Sertong, this is a Sertong, pretty old one. You can see the real gold paint in the background. And I think the deity is Ushnishu Vijaya, who is really a form of Tara. She's got six arms and three heads. She's white. She's holding a Buddha in her in her right hand. And then it's a kind of a usual format for Sertongs to have the deity then repeated in line all throughout the rest of the talk. So you find this, uh, particularly in the older ones. Here's a Martong. This is a Nyingma uh, scholar and yogin. I don't know why the text that he's holding is that kind of pickle green color. It's kind of wonderful to have that green. Um, or maybe it's blue. I've seen some slides of this where it looks blue. But everything is red, and then the lines are all painted in real gold, and there's little bits of black for the hair, and little bits of white for um, skulls and shells and so forth, skull cups. It looks like this 
monk here was an older man and he has white hair, which is interesting. But it can be a portrait. And here's another Martan, very beautiful Shakyamuni Buddha. And the whole figure is painted gold. And there are some stupas here and other Buddhas and uh, Yidams and so forth. This one has the look of as if it were almost brocade or cloth rather than painting, doesn't it? All the red looks like a richly woven um, brocade. Very beautiful. And here's an, a Nagtang with uh, a four-armed Marhakala. Really wrathful. And we can see some other colors, blue, flame colors. There's gold on his sun disk and other colors painted in the uh, lion. Um, I think he's sitting on a lion skin. And he's also kind of tromping on another figure down there. <coughs> another Nagtang. And this one is Yama, the Lord of Death, dancing on his vehicle, which is a, a bull. Is that Yama? I'm sorry, it's not Yama, it's Yamari. <laughs> Yamari is very similar to Yama, but this Yamari is a emanation of Yamantaka. And Yamantaka is a wrathful emanation of Manjusri, and that's why this sword is up here. Okay. And this painting looks like it was a silver painting, doesn't it? But actually, all that light area was a very deep blue at one time. In fact, you can see that all the blue is washed out or faded out, even the blue in the Buddha's uh, hair. So this would be, my guess would be that this is an Amitabha because of the mudra. But again, it could be Shakyamuni in that particular mudra, although he's not usually shown in this mudra. And then many, uh, let's see, Buddhas. This is actually, no, this is Shakyamuni and the Confession Buddhas. Okay. So the, the same painting that um, Anitroma had of the 35 Confession Buddhas are all here. They look quite different, but I think all the dark blacks and blues have disappeared. So this painting has an, another uh, kind of unearthly quality, silvery quality, which is not the way it looked at all at the beginning. And this is another um, Confession Buddha with um, the 35 Confession Buddhas around it, similar to the one that Ani Keltsang painted, but uh, maybe 150 years ago. Hmm? Nice. I don't see that black one, though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And this painting, now we're in the category of enlightened beings, and of course with Buddhas. Um, there are many paintings of Shakyamuni Buddha and showing scenes from his life. So we'll see the Buddha in the center, and then we'll see lots of little figures, and these figures are divided into little areas. Usually there will be buildings or clouds that kind of separate the stories but there'll be life stories of the Buddha uh, surrounding him. This particular tanka I saw in Kathmandu when I was there, and it had, lucky for it, a very glorious old Chinese brocade. Uh, rather unusual. This is not the style that we usually get. It does have the red, yellow, rainbow pattern, but then the blue is taken from some very boldly patterned dragon robe and then it has a big shape at the bottom. This is called a doorway. And traditionally, the doorway in the Tonka is placed in the center down here. It can be small, it can be as large as this. 
This one has a dragon. The doorway is a kind of a way to enter into the, the tanka. So this one is quite um, magnificent in its brocading. And another tanka of the Buddha. And this is the Uh, Maha Pari Nirvana, <laughs> which means the great um, dying pose of the Buddha. As the Buddha uh, died, he laid down on his right elbow and talked to his students and actually left his body in this posture. This is a special kind of Maha Pari Nirvana. And the word Pari Nirvana means kind of. Um, utmost extinction, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so Mahapari Nirvana, um, and this is a central uh, Tibetan painting. Now, last time we looked at a lot of Eastern Tibetan paintings. Can you see the difference between the central and the Eastern, uh, Eastern style here? One of the, the main differences is the style of the clouds. The kind of um, brightness of the color, the, the kind of opacity, the, the kind of jeweled ornamented trees is a kind of a good clue. There is a spaciousness in this, but it's more of a central style than the sort of transparent ones we've been looking at. And when the Buddha died, um, rainbows were said to spontaneously appear. Flowers were beginning to fall from the sky. Can you see the flowers appearing from this cloud? There will be flowers falling, and celestial music will begin to be heard. And there's the Buddha's disciples sitting down in front of him, of course, a lot smaller. I think the main thing that shows the central style is the kind of ornamentation of the trees. Here is Amitabha in his western paradise. So we see a palace, and this is almost like a mandala, but not really, not really a mandala, but almost, showing um, a big circular shape around Amitabha. He's surrounded by various aspects. <coughs> and this is a very Eastern style painting, a kind of cloud forms and spaciousness. And who might this be? Who's that blue Buddha? No, it's not Medicine Buddha because he's not holding the flower. Huh? No, yeah, no ball, no fruit. Right. So it's Akshobhya. He's the blue Buddha. Akshobhya is the blue one. You'll find him in those handouts. He's the one from whom most of the blue deities emanate, including Medicine Buddha and many of the others. So he's surrounded by other little Akshobhyas, isn't he? This is a kind of style that we see often. Many little tiny Buddhas surrounding the main Buddha. Now we're in the category of Bodhisattvas. Hmm? Okay. Um, this picture and the next one are a pair. Can you see how they match? Okay. So we have um, this one is supposed to be Manjusri. He's got the teaching mudra. We doesn't. There's a little sword up there. Can you see it on the left, right here? A little sword. Probably a book over here. And these two paintings, because they're a pair. Instead of being frontal, the bodhisattvas are facing each other slightly. Oops. See how they're facing three-quarter view towards each other. So this is Chenrezig or Avalokiteshvara. 
he's also got the same mudra. And it would be hard for me to know which was which, but when I was at the Vic Victoria and Albert in London, they, they uh, trotted out all these paintings and let me photograph them. It was very kind of them. And this is uh, who they said these paintings were. Uh, you can see that the color is very badly soiled by many years of yak uh, butter offering lamps, mm -hmm. smoke. See how kind of there's no real brightness anymore in the color. So these two are very unusual to, to have um, Manjusri and Avalokiteshvara portrayed like this. I've never seen it before. Here's another Chinrezi surrounded by many other Chinrezis, huh? <laughs> How long did it take to paint this one? <laughs> that wonderful? So the main figure is probably about, you know, 10 inches high, and each one of these guys is about 3 inches high. Whew. Here's another Chinrezi. Um, I found this one in Nepal just by accident, one festival day it was hanging in a shop, not for sale, they were just hanging him up, and he was painted by some Nepalese who had some very Chinese influences. Can you see how Chinese that face is? A lot of Western people like this painting a lot because it looks more real than most of the Tibetan paintings. There's a lot of um, human quality in the face, right? No, it's not really. It's it's really 20th century Chinese influence, and I can't tell you why. Why it's painted by a Nepal Nepalese man who has Chinese influence like this, but it has it has a real quality of um, 20th century Chinese painting. And there's bamboo, and the headdress is also very Chinese. It's heavier and larger than a Tibetan headdress would be. That, that jeweled headdress, but it's a very sweet, compassionate, lovely, lovely um, painting of Chinrezi. Here's Green Tara, the female Bodhisattva of Compassion, otherwise known as Droma. <laughs> we have a living emanation of Droma here in our group, and um, actually, uh, she's often kind of wide-eyed looking, so she just was surprised, or maybe shocked. <laughs> Notice how her hands have red palms. Can you see the red palms in her hands? So we were talking about that color split, you know, when you have a, a darker skin and a different colored palm. This is one of three tankas which had all 21 taras in it. So this, this is a central image, and I think there are seven here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Tonkas and Chinrezi at the bottom. Probably Vajrapani and Manjusri on the sides. I'm not sure if that's Manjusri, but it could be Padmapani. And this is probably a central Tibetan style. The, the clouds have this kind of three-color border around them. So now we're in the category of um, enlightened beings, and here we have two of, or three of the arhats, or disciples of the Buddha, and there's a legend that says that these arhats went to China. In fact, I have one series of paintings showing 18 arhats on the way to China. So here they are riding a horse, and this is a very Chinese looking painting, isn't it? In fact, we don't know if this is Tibetan or Chinese. My guess is that it's Tibetan with a lot of Chinese influence. So here are three of those arhats. This one looks a little bit like Bodhidharma, but I'm not too sure. And here's another arhat, and this is a mixture between central and eastern style. The clouds look kind of central, but everything else looks pretty eastern. And a good example of um, that unsymmetrical composition that we find in these landscape kind of tonkas. This one actually lives in Rome, this particular painting. 
And I think we have a close-up of the gold um, work in the, the robes. There it is. So all the little details of the robes. And another enlightened being, this is a woman, and her name is Machik Labdron. And uh, she lived in about the 10th or 11th century and was a very um, devout, faithful practitioner. She became a great yogini and she developed the practice of Chud, which is, briefly speaking, uh, charnel ground or cemetery practice in which one visualizes uh, non-attachment and its extreme force of visualizing cutting up one's own body into pieces and offering the, your body for all sentient beings. And um, she's shown in this dancing posture, kind of like Vajrayogini. And I think that she's the one who, when she was very old age, received a youthful 17-year-old's body, if I'm not mistaken. So she's always shown in her 17-year-old wonderful white body. <laughs> And one of the uh, early Karmapas, this is Dezin Shegpa. I think it's Dezin Shegpa. Let's see. Yeah. Dezin Shegpa. Um, this painting was done about the year 1700. Now, this is definitely Eastern Karmagadri style. Can you see the, the Chinese influence in this one? The clouds are very soft and misty, and we see um, Kublai Khan, the emperor of China, in the lower right-hand part of the picture right here, and he is actually the one who gave the crown to, the black crown to the crown office. <coughs> So there's a lot of, of Eastern um, Tibetan characteristics, Chinese style. The architecture is very Chinese. It's not even Tibetan. This must be the Emperor's Palace. And the mountains and the way the trees are done is a very, very large Chinese influence, but it's still a Tibetan work. And this is a Nyingma uh, Yogin, whose name is Lama Yuntan Dorji Paul. Uh, this is a good example of of how a vision or a dream is portrayed in Tibetan art. This particular yogi had a vision of Mahakala coming to him and in a huge, enormous form. So we often see his painting with this great Mahakala appearing in a smoky vision right by his head, so this is the Tibetan version of history. <laughs> so he's got the little Pandita's hat in red, hasn't he? That's because he's Nyingma. This one down here? It's almost as if they were trying to show it from above, isn't it? It's interesting. Very unusual, yeah. Being startled by Yama. Yeah, by Mahakala. Oh, by Mahakala. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard to get this whole slide into focus at the same time. The parts of it in and the parts of it around. Well, it's Isn't that great? Mark. Yeah, yeah. So this is Dharmatala. Did I tell you about Dharmatala? No. Dharmatala was one of the. Um, one of the attendants to the original Arhats, and he was a monk and he was a uh, disciple of the Buddha. And the story goes that he used to every morning go to the garden of a beautiful woman and sip the nectar from the flowers. That was his breakfast. And this beautiful woman fell in love with him. And one day she slipped liqueur into the flowers. 
So when he came by to sip the nectar from the flowers, he got very, very drunk, and he passed out. <laughs> when he woke up, he realized that he had passed out, and he didn't know what he'd done. He'd lost his memory, and he thought that he'd broken all his vows. He went straight to the Buddha and confessed that he had probably broken all his, his vows, and what should he do? And the Buddha laughed and said, well, actually you didn't break all your vows. You just got sleepy and went to sleep. But since you were so honest and came and told me about this, I'm going to re reward you. And from now on, uh, this tiger will follow you wherever you go and protect you. And Amitabha will also follow behind you on a cloud. And here's Amitabha up here. So whenever we see Dharmatala, he's got his tiger in. There's a little Amitabha following behind him. So now we're in the category of Yidams. And here is the main Kaju Yidam, which is Vajrayogini. She's one of the main ones anyway. And she's in the dancing posture. And her attributes are she's wearing skull crowns, skull uh, heads in her crown, and she has a skull necklace. She also has a necklace of what are known as fresh heads, which are heads that have been cut off of people, and they're always shown with you know, expressions of anguish, usually. Um, she's got a skull cup full of blood, and she's got a trigu or chopper in her other hand. And she's standing on a sun disk, which is crushing um, a being, and that's symbolic of ego, uh, cutting off ego and cutting off negative emotions and so forth. And she's got a, a staff in her, the crook of her left arm, and has a nimbus of flame. So. She's surrounded here by her entourage of other Vajrayoginis of different colors. Actually, there doesn't seem to be a white one. There's a yellow one, a red one, a blue one, and a green one. And I can't tell who's at the top, but it might be Varochana. It's hard to see the, what the hands are doing up there. This one's very definitely Karmagadri style. And you can tell by the clouds, mostly, that they have these flat bottoms. Okay, here's the, the, the two Yidams together, Vajrayogini and Chakrasavara, as a couple in consort, or Yabyam. So these are the two basic Kaju Yidams, again in Karmagadri style. These are done by Taja. I think we looked at this slide before, the very first day. And again, these clouds with the flat bottoms and very empty kind of background space. So this is a fairly recent painting, maybe done in, in the 50s, 60s. Here is Kala Chakra, and Kala Chakra is the deity of the Kala Chakra Tantra, which deals with vast, <coughs> um, vast cycles of time and space. Um, there's a whole lot more we could say about Kala Chakra, but um, we don't have time for the whole thing. <laughs> but you can see very clearly his various colored arms here. And he looks a little bit like um, Brahma and some of the Hindu deities with all the arms and the various instruments. I think he's very similar looking. So he has a consort who is yellow. She doesn't have various colors. But you can see his red, blue, and white. And I guess he's got some... I don't know if those yellow arms are hers or his. I guess those are hers. She's all yellow, and he's red, white, and blue. Okay. <coughs> and here is um, a uh, Martan, a red painting of Vajrapani, 
Vajrapani appears in both peaceful and wrathful forms, and his main attribute is energy. And we often see him standing as a bodhisattva, along with Padmapani in a peaceful form, standing on either side of Shakyamuni or some other deity. But here he is in a wrathful form. He looks kind of like a Tuar Mahakala. And he should here's a good example of a of a deity that should be blue. But in this painting he's gold. This can also happen in sculpture that the that the color of the deity is blue, but in sculpture it can be gold or metal color. So you have to know that he's blue. But the main giveaway is that he's holding a, a Vajra in his upper right hand. And this is his mudra, which I think is called Tarjani. A good example of Martang and Vajrapani. So this is the area of um, Dharma protectors and Mahakala. Um, six arm Mahakala, and interesting to see Mahakala in a daylight situation. In other words, not a Nagtang, but a regular Tonka. It's almost shocking to see him out in the sunlight, isn't it? <laughs> I'm so used to seeing him in the dark black background painted Tonkas. So here he is, and we have white Mahakala down in front. And he's surrounded by his entourage. One, two, three, four um, other dark deities, Takiraza, and so forth. I'm not sure who the red one is over here. Vajrakini up here and Shakyamuni on top. And this is a female uh, protector. And she looks a little bit like Mahakali, but she's got a lion head. And her name is Senge Droma. And I think that she is an emanation sometimes of, of Padmasambhava. And this particular painting is I love because it's quite abstract, the shapes and the rhythms and the flames and the hair and the fangs and you know, it's almost Walt Disney gone wrathful. <laughs> Very beautiful painting. Sometimes she has a different colored head and body, but in this one her head is blue and her body's blue. So you can tell that it's hard to tell males and females, isn't it, sometimes? But this one definitely has kind of pendulous breasts, so you know that it's female. Now here is a more wrathful uh, kind of protector. And this is um, Yamantaka. We were talking about him earlier, being a wrathful emanation of Manjusri. And you can always tell Yamantaka by the horns. He's got cow horns up here. And, and there are, you know, different degrees of wrathful. There's um, semi-wrathful, and there's wrathful, and this one is um, really wrathful. <laughs> and you can tell by the number of feet and arms the degree of wrathful. This one's, I wouldn't want to meet in a dark alley, I'm afraid. <laughs> And here's Paldan Lama, or Mahakali, um, the one who is the female version of Mahakala. This painting is particularly interesting, and I, I think quite different from most Tibetan Tonkas, in as much as it has more of a depth quality in the shading of the flames. Can you see how these flames are kind of coming out in a depth? Rather than just being flat, you can almost really see a sense of depth in the smoke and flames. And that quality is very, very rare in Tibetan Tonkas. Tibetan Tonkas are usually quite linear, and we see planes, and we see some shading, but not this kind of shading where things are really coming out towards you. So I find this, this particular painting really interesting in that regard. So another... Um, Paldan Lamo, or Mahakali, is behind these drapes, and the reason I'm showing this is to show an alternative style of covering the tonka, so that the tonkas are, were covered with a kind of veil, and usually it's just one long, long piece of cloth, 
both to protect them sometimes from the butter lamp smoke, and if it's a wrathful deity, to hide them from the uninitiated. So this one uh, is a different style where these draperies hanging down are separated like this. They're all kind of separate and they're tied off to the side to reveal the deity underneath. So here is uh, Mahakali and she's got a wonderful Chinese dragon brocade, hasn't she? So this is probably a pretty old one. We don't see this kind of brocade very often. So another um, form of Yamantaka, whose Vajra, his name is Vajra Bhairav, and Bhairav was a form of uh, Mahakala. So this is another protector on the very wrathful level. And again, interesting to see him in daylight. Sometimes we see him at night, or on a, in a Nagtan painting, which makes it look like night. Now here is the Naga King, a Nagtan of the Naga King, another protector. Extremely wrathful. Look at the number of heads he's got and arms. And his body is all serpent, and he's surrounded by kind of a mandala structure and other serpents around up in here and some other naga types swimming in the water also a very unusual painting and now we're going into the category of um, national protectors lokapalas it's called and um, this is the guardian king of the south, Virudaka, and you'll find them listed in those handouts I gave you. Virudaka is from the south. He's blue. His symbol is a sword. And the next one is by Zravana. He's the guardian of the north, and he's supposed to be yellow. He's kind of pink here, but usually he's yellow. And he carries a banner. Well, it looks more like an umbrella, but I guess we can call that a banner. And um, all of them are wearing uh, clothing that's kind of like Tibetan kings and generals wore in the 7th or 8th century. And I think there's some influence from Mongolia and China also in their accoutrement, the way they dress. They look a little bit like samurais. Oh, um, Vaisravana has also got this mongoose in his hand, usually. And the mongoose is spewing little jewels. Can you see them down here? A string of different colored jewels. That's the symbol of um, wealth and um, what's the other word? Fecundity. Oh well, um, <laughs> uh, fruitfulness, etc. And the red one is Virupaksha, and he holds a stupa in his right hand, little stupa, and. Uh, his color is red, like Chinrezi coming from the west. And the last one I don't have for you, um, his name is Dhritarashtra, and he comes from the east, and he's white, and he plays the lute. I have some pictures of him somewhere else, but I'm afraid they didn't get into this presentation. So the next category is mandalas. And this is the first painting I think I've shown you that shows really early Tibetan art. And, and most of the early Tibetan painting up to about the 14th, 15th century has similar characteristics to this mandala in as much as the main overall color is red. And the reason that it's red is coming from the traditions of India and Nepal, where red was the color of religion, still is. You know, the robes are yellow and red. And most of the paintings had red backgrounds, 
and there was some color. You'll see these are mandalas. There's the white, and the yellow, and the red, and the green, and so forth. But the overall feeling is red. And it wasn't until after the 16th century that the influence of China came in and space, and we began to see blue and green and landscape. So this is kind of a, a prototype of all early painting, that there's no sense of space, and everything is rather architectural. Each deity has his own little shallow niche, and the color has a very warm feeling, and it's rather opaque, and never really feels transparent, as in the paintings we've been seeing recently. This early mandala shows four mandalas all together in the same space, which is not uncommon, particularly uh, early Tibetan art. And it's probably from Ngor Monastery, N-G-O-R, pronounced Ngor, which comes from southern Tibet. And is very famous for its mandalas. It's a Sakyapa Monastery. In this, in this photo we see a very good example of Ken Rinpoche's collection of tonkas, which are all mandalas which came from his monastery in southern Tibet called Ngor Monastery, N-G-O-R, Ngor Monastery. And Ken Rinpoche was the abbot of that monastery, but he moved to Tokyo, oh, maybe 30 years ago, and uh, did some wonderful things, in, including inventing the first Tibetan typewriter. He had this um, large volume of mandalas published by a very, very high quality Japanese uh, printer. The first edition cost $2,500, and the cheaper edition was around $1,500. It was beautifully boxed, and they were larger than life size, and uh, just an extraordinary collection. So we're very happy to see part of this collection in our own slides. We're actually almost through. So mandalas. Here is the mandala of Kala Chakra. It's kind of like the one they did in sand, but maybe has more detail. And the mantra of the Kala Chakra deity is written out in this outer ring in the old style Tibetan letters, which are called Lancha. L-A-N-T-S-H-A, which are derived from the Sanskrit Devnagri, or uh, letters of the gods. So that's a good example of the Kala Chakra mandala. And this is an example of a stupa. You see very few stupa paintings. This one has Tsongkhapa in the center, actually sitting in front of the stupa. And we have standing bodhisattvas, eight of them, which are also rather unusual. We don't usually see these eight standing bodhisattvas. And then we have kind of a chorus line of female bodhisattvas, maybe kind of the consorts or partners of these up here at the bottom. It's very lovely, isn't it? Very beautiful. So obviously it's a galupa tonka. Snow lines on the bottom have red instead of green hair. Usually they have green hair. <laughs> so this is the Wheel of Life, and I've given you a, a, a handout on the Wheel of Life as well, included in your uh, handouts this morning. And this is the Teaching Tonka. And it talks about, this is Yama, the Lord of Death. And he's, he's the one who keeps the wheel revolving from birth to death. In the very center are the three poisons, um, lust, greed, and what's the other one? Um, egotism? Hmm? Ego illusion. Illusion. And then... This one's different from some of the other um, 
there's also in this one on, on the door here you can see on my door going out you'll see another ring that's missing from this one but then the the uh, realms that one can be reborn into um, let's see the hell realms the lower realms are down here looks like hell realm here being boiled and so forth it, that's well those must be oh those may be the Praetors yeah that's the Praetors yeah yeah the Praetors over on the right are the ones who are reborn with tiny mouths and huge bellies right and the hell realms down here are being chopped up you know, by huge knives and being boiled and this is the animal realm which is also a lower realm and then in the higher realms you can be reborn as a god and I guess the God realm is the one, I guess it's the one on the left. I don't see anything specifically God-like about it. Yeah. And the one on the right is the human realm. So these are the five possibilities of rebirth. And it's really a strange one. That's a strange one, yeah. And then the 12 Nidanas are the linking conditions to death and rebirth are shown symbolically around the outside ring and these are um, we were discussing this the other night a little bit at the study group based on one condition being dependent upon another it's slightly different from something causing something it's it's because of this, this happens. So there's a dependence upon, for example, um, cognition, uh, sensory um, perception, leading to grasping or desire, and then that leading to another condition which finally ends up in sickness, old age, death, and then rebirth. So there's 12 different stages. And the teaching is that if you can find the weak chain in the link, then you can be uh, emancipated or liberated from death and rebirth and get off the wheel. Um, the other version is that you can get rid of all of them at once by understanding the whole process. <laughs> um, Anyway, this, it's a great teaching tool, and it's not as simple as it looks. <laughs> At least in practice. In theory, one can explain it for one to actually practice this and actually um, succeed in getting off the wheel would take, I think, many lifetimes of um, diligence and awareness. And so it seems. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it's a brilliant and wonderful um, teaching of the Buddha, and the Tibetans have made it into a very powerful, symbolic, visual uh, aid. We can talk more about that later. Here's another version of it, and here we, sh here we can see this other ring that's missing from that last one that shows um, these ascending towards the heaven realms and descending towards the hell realms. So again, it's the same thing basically. This one's divided into six, no it's only five parts, right? This would obviously be the god realms up here. This looks more godlike clouds and this is a, the, uh, yeah. Kala Rinpoche had this painting um, painted on his wall of his teaching room, which shows Mount Meru. Now, Mount Meru is actually a mountain that stands on its peak and goes up like this. <laughs> it's terrible when you're editing slides and putting them into a, s a slide reel because it always looks like it's upside down. <laughs> and then there are the continents surrounding Mount Meru and the uh, waters, the Iron Ring Mountain, and so forth, all of which you find in the mandala practice. So this is the, the Tibetan cosmology or explanation for how things are put together. 
This painting is a little out of um, the ordinary. It's an offering painting to wrathful deities. Wrathful deities like um, they like to eat animals and they like to eat blood and drink blood and so forth. So we have a skull cup with um, some symbolic kinds of torma blood drinking things. And there's a strange stupa that has a skeleton kind of. Well, I don't know, understand that at all. And it's <coughs> quite amazing. And another offering tonka, and this one is also called a projection tonka, where the deity is missing and the meditator is asked to visualize the deity, to project the deity into the tonka. So everything's there. In this case, it's Paul Din Lama Mahakali. You can see her white mule. And there's her bone necklaces and apron and crown of skulls. And everything's there except the figure herself. So these are rather rare paintings and uh, quite, quite interesting collections of offerings to wrathful deities. Another um, one like this, it's a projection tanka. This one is, uh, I think, Yamantaka, or let's see. And this is Yama, god of the dead, who's riding the bull, and he's also not there. And you can see the serpent sits around his body and his crown and his staff and so forth, and he's just missing. This is a assembly tree or lineage tree tanka, and the visualization for this, we saw one by Singe, didn't we, a couple weeks ago. This is the visualization for doing Nendro prostrations, and it really helps to have a visual aid. So here you visualize yourself standing in the center and all sentient beings surrounding you in front of a lake, and then the lake is this tree, and the top of the tree, in this case it's Kaju, there's that whole lineage, Dorji Chang, Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa, Melareva, Gampopa, and all the Kaju Lamas, and there's Vajradhara in the center, and all the Buddhas, all the Bodhisattvas, all the Edams, and all the protectors, and here's all the Dharma books, the texts up here, this guy, plus other assorted um, dignitaries from the lineage. It's a lot to hold in your mind without a little bit of help. <laughs> and even with a little bit of help, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to um, visualize. You get something in place, and it, when you're thinking about something else, it slips away. And, and here's a um, Galupa version of that. Same thing, only slightly different, huh? Stone Kappa and that lineage, and there's the tree at the bottom. And another kind of painting that we see, miniature painting, is, uh, for example, the five Dhyani Buddhas, or Jinas, uh, in a crown, which is worn for Vajracharya um, empowerments. They wear it in Kala Chakra paramats and so forth, and so we have the five Buddhas and the five families, Vairochana, Amitabha, Ratna, Sambhava, Mogasiddhi, and Shobhya, painted, you know, quite small, three inches high. <coughs>